All right, so in this video, we had uh, a conversation around traditional versus Roth investments. It had pretty good traction there, if you haven't seen it. It also generated a lot of comments. Um, right. Because people feel very passionately about one or the other. Uh, most of the comments came because they didn't make it past minute 20, which is understandable. It's, a, it's an hour-long video. People have busy lives. If they would make it past minute 20, uh, a lot of these would be addressed. But... Um, we wanted to go through some of these these questions, and then maybe you can touch touch on them and, and take us through this. So when you talk about Roth and traditional, this one was uh, a big advantage to Roth IRAs or Roth investments in general is they do not have required minimum distributions. Um, so maybe you can kind of tackle RMDs as they relate to Roths versus traditional. Yeah, huge advantage. Um, traditional, just to give everybody context, um, the age has changed between 70 and a half, 72, 73, 75 coming up for some people. Then this is the age at which you need to start taking money out of your portfolio. And when I say need, it's not because you need it. It's because the government needs you to pay some taxes. <laughs> yeah. So they have a schedule and they say, hey, you have to take out X percent per year and the dollar amount or the percentage amount goes up. So it starts off a little bit under 4%. And then by the time you get to 115, the table stops counting and you're taking half the portfolio every year. Yeah. So it goes from just under 4% to 50% over as you get older. Now, the the curve of that increase is is kind of flat. And then as you get into your late you know 90s and into 100, it, it spikes up because they know you're not going to live as long after yeah. that. So they're trying to have you pay taxes on as much as possible before you pass away without being terrible to you and making you pay taxes on everything and then living another 20 years. So they're trying to predict that and they do a pretty good job with with tables, actuarial tables to figure that out. So that's just a little background for everybody. Yeah, the the traditional forces you into minimum distributions. The Roth mm -hmm. does not. Yeah. I think that, I'll give you an example. I just was strategizing for an individual on this. And the first step is usually for us to take, okay, all your traditional money, what if what if the thing you're most afraid of actually happens? You have to take a minimum distribution from this account in your lifetime. And we want to figure out what does that look like at 73 when you first have to start taking it out. And, and if we find it's only $40,000 a year plus your social security and you don't have any other income, like that's probably not that big of a deal. Yeah. And, and you you probably pay somewhere around 10 to 12 or 15 percent taxes on that. Again, not a huge deal. And but so I'll say, but as you get older, the percentage goes up. And so if you're if your investments climb and the percentage goes up, then maybe you're having to take 15 or 10 or 15 percent of the portfolio. But that's not for for decades. Yeah. Like that's not until late 80s, mid 90s before you have to take that high of a percentage. So it's not going to climb super fast. Now, the real rub here, though, is if one of you passes away and you're filing jointly and all of a sudden you have to file under single tax brackets, basically all the lines get cut in half. So you hit the 12, 15%. I say 12 or 15 because it's changing, but yeah. that 12 slash 15% or 22, 25%, you just hit those a lot sooner if you are single. So the way that I would strategize around this is first model out, Worst case scenario, you have to pay a full minimum distribution, figure out what that is, and throw that through a rough estimate on taxes. Your average tax rate may be 7, 8, 9%. If that's the case, mm -hmm. it's really not that big of a deal. Now, if you are throwing a minimum distribution like that on top of a lot of other income, maybe you have rental income, maybe you have royalties, pensions, Social Security, you're in a situation where you're already at two or $300,000 of income in retirement, and you're stacking on, you have a three or four or $5 million IRA, which we've seen before, yeah. and you're stacking on a minimum distribution on top of that, well, now all of a sudden you're in a world of hurt. The question though is, is that even still less painful than you converting today? It might be, because maybe you're making, maybe that person's making $800,000 a year right now in income, mm -hmm. then stacking on Roth conversions on top of that is probably worse than just taking the minimum distribution and having it slide in somewhere in the two, three, four hundred thousand dollar range. Yeah. So, and if you didn't listen to the first episode on this, like we're taking all of these comments have to do with the fact or the assumption that if your tax rate is the same and your growth rate is the same, you'll end up with the same spendable. 
That is important for people to understand. For some reason, even a lot of a lot of comments, they're like, "But what if tax rates go up?" And I'm like, "Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. If your tax rate is going to go up, you should probably do Roth. Yeah. If your tax rate is going to go down, you should do traditional. Or if you're just trying to max fund your contribution limits, then then you, let's call it." 22,500 into a Roth 401k is more than 22,500 to a traditional 401k. Or you want a little bit of everything for control, degrees of freedom, we call it, um, yeah. flexibility. So for that person, minimum distributions matter. Model out the worst case scenario. Model out the scenario of you convert everything over to Roth. And then model out a middle scenario. And then you'll start to get a better feel for which one produces the best overall tax situation. I do see, though... I had this one client where he basically has a couple million dollars of IRA money and that's it. Mm. And a lot of social security income. And this is really fascinating because if this individual does not convert to Roth and just lets it grow and takes the minimum distribution, that minimum distribution money forces social security to also be taxed. Mm. But if he has no other income, he has about seventy or eighty thousand dollars between him and his wife of social security income. They can they can basically make all of that social security income disappear. Hmm. So oh. you could, th this individual, if he's willing to bite the bullet a little bit, convert to Roth from ages sixty to seventy three, and get that couple million dollars over to Roth, then not only do they not have minimum distributions but they only have to show like eight to $9,000 of their social security income. Mm. Standard deduction will wipe that out. And basically they're at a 0% tax bracket for the rest of their lives, yeah. which, so that's, you model out both extremes <laughs> and decide if in some cases, the optimal thing for a retiree is to be at one extreme or the other. And then in some cases, it's not, the, the extremes are not helpful. You actually want to just fill up whatever headroom you have in the 10 and 12% brackets because you know you're going to be a little bit higher later and you fill up yeah. as you go. Well, and I hope the point that people got, if they made it far enough, was like, you're not recommending everybody go to Roth. You're not recommending everybody get traditional. It's, right. It depends on your situation. I'm and recommending often, you, case, and it's both. Yeah, I'm just recommending you pay the least amount of taxes possible. Yeah. That's, yeah. A, that's what we're talking about, right? Well, and I uh, clarifying on that is that the least amount of taxes possible as a percentage of what you have or the total dollar amount going to the government. Does that Good make sense? Good question. Um, we're talking about... You know what? That's true. Correct. Correct that then. <laughs> I'm not recommending they pay the least amount of tax as possible. I'm rec in dollars. Yeah. I'm recommending you create the most spendable wealth. Yeah. If you, which might actually mean a higher dollar amount into taxes, depending on the situation. Yeah. So it's the end goal is, is what matters to an individual is how much money they can spend. Mm -hmm. So after taxes, I'm trying to create the highest spendable wealth. That's yeah. the bottom line. Well, another thing going kind of finishing this RMD discussion is the potential that that could throw you into a higher income bracket for Medicare and IRMA. So the base amount, if we're going into 2024, is $174.70 a month if you're making $500,000 or more. And there are different brackets or levels here, but that's $594 a month. So it's a almost, yeah, it's $400 plus $420 more per month per person those, yeah per person right so, so a couple each so has to do that. think about that that way you're thinking that's about a five thousand dollar additional cost per person per year yeah for that year so that's ten thousand dollars if you're a couple and i will then take that ten thousand dollars and divide it into the amount you were able to convert over let's say it was a hundred thousand dollars you converted over to a roth and you had it cost you ten thousand dollars of extra medicare premiums not quite 10, but we're using easy yeah. math. Yeah, That's a 10% tax for one year, right? That's yeah. not forever. That's for that year. So you just need to think about your Medicare excess charge as an additional tax rate. Yeah, And that will help you know if it's worth it or not. Yeah. So this one came up a lot. It was anybody who thinks that tax rates aren't going to go up in the future is crazy. Yeah. So maybe you can explain tax rates, them potentially going up and how that impacts this decision. Yeah, I'm not going to call anybody crazy anywhere, <laughs> um, but I do believe the tax rates will go up. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if they were calling us crazy. Maybe that's what they were doing. I don't know. They probably call okay. us crazy. But I think tax rates will go up. Right now, the, the um, Bush era tax cuts were temporary. So 
the current schedule that we have, and there's a lot that changes after 2025. We did an evening, um, we call it a boot camp for all of our clients and anybody else who wanted to come at a local college. And we rent out an auditorium and we just bring everybody in. And we spent quite a bit of time, I taught on this exact topic, what happens after 2025. Certain deductions come back, certain deductions go away. And specifically, the thing that will affect everybody is the tax, marginal tax bracket lines and percentages change. Mm -hmm. Right now, we're at 10, then 12%, then 24%, and it keeps going up. And those are the three brackets I usually talk about most because that's what most retirees are in. Yeah, It goes 10, 15, and 20. Sorry, I said 10, 12, and 22 yeah. is what it should be. Yeah, okay. 10, 12, 22. 10, 15, 25. So yeah. the 10% bracket stays the same. 12 goes to 15. 22 to 25, and it keeps going up and it'll go up to 28 from 24 on the next bracket up, you get the idea. So pretty much most of people are going to have an additional 3%, uh, 3 to 4% in each bracket, except for the 10. Mm -hmm. Rates are going up. That's 2026. So if you are thinking about your strategy around converting to a Roth, you might wait the years in 2023. We don't, we don't have a lot of time left for 2023, yeah. but 2023, 2024, and 2025, a little heavier because you're getting that at a lower tax rate than in 2026 and beyond. But the point in the comment is actually not the sunsetting of the Bush era tax cuts. Mm -hmm. I think the point in the comment is we are spending so much money as a government. How in the world would we... Um, not have insane tax rates in the future. Thirty-four trillion dollar debt is what it was talking about. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I politically, I'm very in the middle and and nerdy enough to take the tests to find that out. Yeah. So don't take anything I say from one side or the other. But the reality is the debt is big. But our ability to be the reserve currency in the U.S. and have the dollar be the safe haven where every other country looks to put money when their own currency isn't as safe, gives us immense power as a nation in the world. And it also provides us with a lot of opportunity to control that, that debt and asset value. I mean, yeah, if, if we have that much debt, but we just print more money, it makes it a lot easier to pay it off, right? So it, it basically, a lot of your clients may be really stressed about that. I actually, or and a lot of people who are listening who are in their 60s may be really stressed about that. I think that's more my problem than their problem. Mm. Do you know what I mean? I think, yeah. I think I'll be paying for that later than more so than they, than yeah. they will be. Um, okay, so going back to will rates rise? Yes, I think so. I think beyond the Bush era tax cuts, we will go through in a, a five to 10 year period where we are just livid about tax rates because we hate them today and they're mm -hmm. pretty darn good right now. Yeah. I mean, they're they're really, really reasonable compared to history. Once again, I'm not talking about like whether taxes are good or or how much, how big or smaller government should be. I'm saying that compared to history, we currently have really, really low tax rates. So if you just believe in mean reversion, meaning things will come back to the average, I would expect tax rates to go up and even be higher than average in the future for a period of time. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that, that lends itself to do more Roth conversions while you have the chance if you believe that way. Yeah, and I think the big thing too here that you've touched on in other things is that in retirement, your tax rate isn't like if I'm if I'm making my earnings before retirement and my income brackets and my expenses and everything else are so much higher, say I'm making five hundred thousand dollars a year in retirement, I potentially could live on a hundred thousand dollars a year. So right. I'm dropping tax brackets in that sense. Not that tax rates are dropping, but I am dropping tax brackets. Right. I've seen people in the highest bracket, which is, I'm thinking of a couple right now in my mind, they are in the 37% tax bracket, the highest bracket possible. When they retire, based on, I know what they spend because we do their planning, based on what they spend and what how we will be able to control their tax rate in retirement, they're only going to be in the 10 and 12% tax brackets. Mm -hmm. That's an extreme example. That's not normal. But they're in the highest, and they're going to go to the second to the lowest. So even if the twelve goes up to fifteen or twenty, even if the twelve doubles and goes to more than you know more than doubles, it goes to twenty five. That's still cheaper than thirty seven percent for them. Yeah. If they stay in that highest tax bracket, it's going to go up to thirty nine point five after twenty twenty five, and then probably higher in the future. And at one point, it was ninety percent in the past. So yeah. that's. I, I just think they will drop rates. They will drop brackets, even though rates will go up. Yeah. Um, another question we had is that you referenced um, 
potential, like they were making over $500,000 a year and they were putting it into a Roth uh, 401k. And so the question was, well, wait a minute, you have maximum earnings to allow you to put it into a Roth IRA. So I think I gave away the answer, but maybe you can clarify the earnings kind of cut off for Roth contribution. Yeah. In your mind, separate 401ks and IRAs as much as possible as the account type. And then the tax structure is a subset of those two account types. So you have 401k, then Roth or traditional, you have IRA, Roth and traditional. All those income rules are, are clouding up the IRA situation. Mm-hmm. They just don't apply to the 401k. Perfect. So you're, it's pretty simple. You could be making as much money as you want and you can contribute to a Roth 401k. I mean, at some point, it, it's kind of hard to justify because your tax rate is so high, mm-hmm. but that's a strategy thing and not an eligibility thing. Gotcha. The, the other thing, how much do you, how much did they ask about like contribution eligibility to IRAs, backdoor Roths, um, you know, contribution eligibility or deductibility, IRA versus Roth? Did anybody ask about that? Um, they talked about backdoor Roth came up a lot in terms of like, here's what people should do right, yeah. in comments. So backdoor Roths came up a lot. Eligibility, not as much other than like, I thought that there were income limits. There was an eligibility around like kids. So paying kids the amount or a spouse, right? So a spouse has to earn a certain amount to fully fund it, but it's the couple or, or going through that yeah. kind of stuff. Okay. So let's, let's first... Um, dispel some confusion around the spousal IRA. Some people think because the way the government talks about a spousal IRA, they think that is an account type. Mm -hmm. A spousal IRA is not an account type. It's just a contribution eligibility rule. So people are like, well, wait a second. What if my spouse puts money into my spousal IRA? Can I put money into the spousal IRA? It's like, you'll never, at least far as I've never seen any brokerage firm account holder of any type, write on the statement spousal IRA. Yeah. It's just a traditional IRA or a rollover IRA or a Roth IRA. And the spousal eligibility is what we're talking about here. And as long as w- the couple, someone, has made money, you can contribute up to how mu- however much you've made or the maximum contribution limits, which tend to go up every year, but yeah. $6,500 a person if you're under 50. So if you had... of income, you could max out each of your contributions to each of your IRAs, even if all that is earned by one person, if it's split, however it's split, it doesn't matter. You can make the contribution to either. We had one question in there that he said, well, what if I make a contribution for my spouse, but then my spouse earns some money? Do we have to pull that back out and then have her make the contribution? The IRS isn't stressing about that. They're just looking at how much total income does the couple have? Do they have enough to be able to make the contribution and your limit is like if you only made two thousand dollars in the year, you can't put in sixty five hundred. Right. You you could put in two thousand into one, or you could put a thousand into each, or however you want to set that up. Got it. So that's that was the first one, a spousal IRA. But you also mentioned backdoor Roth. At some point, you are no longer eligible to contribute to a Roth IRA, and that's and I I always these change every year too. But let's just it's about two hundred thousand dollars. Okay. So, you know, if if you want to set a goal for yourself. Set a goal to not be eligible to contribute to a Roth IRA. That's Perfect. a that's a cool goal when you cross that. Yes. Um, if if okay, so at some point you can't contribute to a Roth. The rules are that you can deduct a regular IRA contribution up to a certain level, but there's no limit on how much you can put in. Sorry, let me start over. There's no limit on how much you can make and put into an IRA. Hmm. So they're a little bit different. The Roth is, hey, you can't even put the money in this account if you make too much. Traditional is, you can put money in no matter how much you make. You just can't get a tax deduction for it at certain levels. Got it. So what's happening there is, by the way, the traditional line of where you get a deduction, you lose the deduction before you get to the 200 where you can't contribute to a Roth. Okay. So what what people are doing there is typically the folks who make a lot of money cannot make a contribution to a Roth anymore. So they might be making $300,000 a year. They can't make a Roth contribution, but they can put money in a traditional because there's no income limit. They can put Mm -hmm. money in a traditional. They're not getting a tax deduction on it. They don't really care because then they convert that after tax money in the traditional over to the Roth. And now it's, it's, they call that a backdoor, 
which I wouldn't call it that because the IRS is probably not going to love that. I would call it conversions of non-deductible IRA contributions, but that's definitely nerdy and not what people want to call it, right? Yeah. But but anyway, so the, the, the problem with this, the pitfall, this is just if, if you're thinking about this strategy, if you have $100,000 in an IRA that's all pre-tax and you drop $5,000, actually, I'm going to make the math even easier. Can we take that back? Yes. If you have $95,000 in an account that's all pre-tax and you put $5,000 in and you decide I'm going to convert that $5,000 of after-tax money, the IRS does not let you select the source mm -hmm. on the conversion. They say, okay, 95% of the total account is pre-tax, 95% of your conversion is taxable income to you. Gotcha. And then you end up leaving some after-tax money over there and you have pre-tax money and now you're having to manage that and account for that, which is a is a nightmare. I think a comment actually said that that's a nightmare. Right. Yeah. Um, okay, so then what you do is you take all the pre-tax money in your IRA, roll it over. There's this curtain between 401ks and IRAs in the IRS's mind. So you take all that pre-tax money in your IRA, roll it into your 401k. IRS no longer counts it as pre-tax IRA money. Mm -hmm. So now you have an empty IRA. You make a contribution to it. And then later you could do a non-deduct because it's non-deductible, right? Mm -hmm. It's all after tax. So when you do the conversion, it's all after tax. And so you don't have to pay taxes and you're able to convert it all. Mm -hmm. That's the backdoor Roth. Is there like a, was there something I heard that was like a super backdoor or something like that? Yeah, so that's less common. It's the same exact concept as the as the the IRA, but the yeah. IRA only lets you put in, you know, sixty five hundred. The 401k allows you to put in 22,500 and, and then, so there are rules that allow some, and this is employer specific, some plans will allow an individual on top of their regular contributions to drop in another maybe 22,500 of after tax dollars. It needs that capability in the plan. It also needs the capability to do in service conversions of just that or in service, meaning you're still employed. That's what yeah, they mean by in yeah, service yeah. or an in service rollover of that money out of the plan before you're 59 and a half or if you're over 59 and a half, maybe that will work. That's usually a, a kicker. So the point is, yeah, your plan has to have like two or three things set up. Your employer has to be pretty savvy to know like, oh, people want to do this. Mm -hmm. We better make these rules in our plan available. Um, so anyway, you have to be able to make after tax contributions. You have to be able to do maybe an, a rollover of just the after-tax source and you roll it out then to a Roth IRA. So then you're getting like twenty to $30,000. Okay. That, that's less common just because fewer employers have those rules set up. A lot of them are like, I have a real job. I cannot sit here and help you with your personal finance strategies. Yeah. And they're like, our 401k plan, we're not changing that yeah. for you. That's yeah. usually what happens. That's so interesting. Well, and and maybe this this might take us in somewhere we don't want to go. But um, the question is, Roth sound very good. However, the government said people would never pay more than three percent um, towards Social Security. Later, they tweaked that figure, and ever since, it's been off to the races in terms of they said it would never be taxed, it would never be whatever. Do you foresee any circumstances where? And you can say like I can't answer this, but where a try. Roth a Roth could become taxable because Social Security income wasn't supposed to be taxable, and then right. and then it became taxable. Yeah, I try to look at statistics on things and probability of things and assess. Um, we don't have data to do any statistical analysis, but we do have. Like I feel like you can make a reasonable estimate based on voting populations. I'll lean back on that pretty regularly like what is the what is the public will for that and yeah. what kind of of insane like revolt would you have and how mad would people be and how how likely is that to happen um i think that what will happen so, so instead of let's just take a step back so the question is how likely is it that i do all these conversions pay all these taxes and then i end up having to pay taxes on it later anyway mm -hmm. I think that your, your likelihood of being double taxed is very, very low. The likelihood of potentially having to pay taxes on just the growth in the Roth IRA, that would be more likely. Uh, they're not, I mean, double taxation on something would just be insane. Yeah. Um, but all of this is 
all of it is extremely unlikely. If the government is trying to come up with income and trying to improve, there are so many other levers. I mean, imagine a room with a thousand levers just sticking out of the wall and they know that that 10 of them are just going to just create an immense amount of anger in their voting population, they're going to pick on the other 990 levers. And yeah. to me, that's one of the 10 out of yeah. a thousand that that they could do that would really, really just upset people. So there are so many other things they can do. And, and namely, people in their 30s and 40s, I think, will be subject to a lot higher taxes on things like Social Security or like we already have an investment income tax. A lot of people don't know about it. Mm-hmm. There's a 3.8% tax on any investment income when your income is greater than $250,000. Mm-hmm. A lot of people don't even know that that exists because that it doesn't ever show up. And for the people it does show up, I think more than half of them don't even know they're paying it mm-hmm. because it, it gets calculated deep in the tax returns and then it just shows up as a total federal tax. So they don't even know that there's that 3.8% tax. So there are so many levers, so many ways they can they can change things and I just feel like that's extremely unlikely. Mm-hmm. I do see, I mean, I'm 39. By the time I get into my 60s, I think Social Security full retirement age will be quite a bit higher than it is today, mm-hmm. um, 67 for, for most of us, right? I, that's a pipe dream. It's going to be higher. There was a comment on this that, that that comment or that assumption is way off base. There's no way they would raise the full retirement age. Oh, they've done like, it well, two or three yeah, or four times. It. It's like, <laughs> well, okay. I mean, if they've already done it, I feel like that's... They, they already have a model. When you have yeah. a model for something and, and you saw that it didn't didn't make you lose an election, it didn't yeah. um, make the public too mad. The reason it doesn't make them mad is because they grandfather all the people in yeah. who are currently on Social Security. And so the rest of us aren't even thinking about Social Security. And then we find out a decade later that they made the change. Yeah. So that's where, that's where I think they will strategize around like, okay, well, you people who really care about it, you're fine. We'll leave yeah. you in the way it is currently. We'll grandfather you. But the people who aren't yet at the door, don't even know there's a door to walk through. Yeah. Those are the people that are going to pay. I think someday I could be means tested out of Social Security. Talk, forget taxation. I think if, if there's a chance somebody who's young today saves enough that they may come back and say, hey, you have a lot of money because you've saved a lot. I mean, they don't say because you've saved a lot. They're just yeah. going to say you have a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. And therefore, we're not going to give you Social Security income. We're going to give it to the other people or we're going to yeah. use it to to build up the trust. And like those are the types of things I would see happening before they get into we're going to start taxing Roths. Yeah. I mean, it's just such a – it's down the road. Yeah. The means testing that you brought up was also mentioned in the comments. Oh, when, was it? When you have that many comments, like everything just comes, was comes to mentioned. the surface. And they've said like means testing is a horrible idea. I think that because you mentioned it in the last video, I think it's important for people to understand that because it's mentioned doesn't mean that we necessarily support oh, that idea. No, not at all. I would be really upset about that. It. <laughs> yeah, it's just like that is something. Yeah, I'd be really upset attention. about it. But yeah. I'm also trying to be a realist about the situation. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm also thinking like I'm going to plan as if – my entire retirement picture is on me and me alone. Yeah. Any Social Security help I get, any extra, you know, Medicare help I get, like yeah. icing on the cake. But I'm planning as if I'm running this thing solo. <laughs> You're awesome, man. Yeah, go to financialcall.com for all kinds of fun information on all of these topics. There's a whole season that's dedicated to these types of conversations. Um, eight seasons that are out there on all kinds of fun stuff. We've got that in the description. Seriously, I thank you. Thanks, for Eric. This has been fun. Be here. Yeah.